Thank you very much. Um, there's a great scene in uh, All the President's Men when uh, the cub reporter, Bob Woodward, is down in a garage somewhere in this town with uh, what we later learned was an FBI agent but uh, was referred to as Deep Throat, and they were trying to unravel the break-in uh, that occurred in the Democratic National Headquarters, and Deep Throat told uh, Woodward, follow the money. So it was a restructuring guy uh, trying to unravel uh, a problem as big as what to do with Fannie and Freddie. Uh, I, and not having any particular expertise in mortgage finance, I'm not a mortgage investor, um, but I'm a restructuring guy. Uh, I tried to follow the money and figure out um, where we are uh, in order to figure out where we might want to get to. Um, so rather than coming at this from any ideological perspective, government should be in, the government should be out, um, to kind of look at the markets as they are today and Fannie and Freddie's role in the markets uh, and how we might uh, restructure the relationship between Fannie and Freddie, the implicit guarantee, which clearly was gamed, uh, and to try to, without wrecking the housing market given the centra central role they currently play. <laughs> so if you'll forgive me, I'll, I think a lot of this is familiar to all of you, but it wasn't familiar to me, and I wanted to sort of trace the uh, – the path we got to as we thought about how to uh, fix this market. And so first, housing finance system on life support. As the previous two panels have said, uh, the blue bars are the government sector uh, and the uh, red are the private. You can see that um, the government sector now dominates. 90% or more of all new originations are ending up on the balance sheet of the United States government, either indirectly through Fannie and Freddie, and I say indirectly because they're not on the balance sheet of the government of the United States. They're being supported by a Treasury stock preferred purchase agreement. They're in conservatorship. They're private companies with an odd charter, uh, but they're being effectively guaranteed by the United States through the net worth guarantee provided by the Treasury Department. And then you have Gini, uh, uh, which is being guaranteed directly, full faith and credit of the United States. Uh, and, then the, um, and then the federal home loan bank system where banks effectively discount their mortgage assets uh, for liquidity purposes. So 90% of the market now is government is ending up on the balance sheet of the United States directly or indirectly. Um, the, when you look at where these loans now reside, so that's 90% was new originations. This is sort of just a summary of where the risk is currently residing. You've got 4.6 on Fannie, Fannie and Freddie's balance sheets. Ginny's got 1.2. The Federal Home Loan Bank Board's got half a trillion. Private MBS, 1.1 outstanding, and privately held loans, 2.9. So almost 70% of this market uh, is uh, on the government's balance sheet. And the uh, – stop there. Uh, a lot of talk in this town about wanting to crowd private capital back in. We have to – the Treasury white paper talks about, you know, bringing more um, private capital back in. We've heard Senator Crocker talk about bringing more private capital back in. But the reality is, is the private capital is going the other direction right now. It may be a function of the fact that the government is unduly depressing returns on mortgage assets, but the truth of the matter is, is that the system uh, away from the government, including Fannie and Freddie, were grossly undercapitalized coming into this crisis. Uh, and banks are going the opposite direction. So when you look at what's going on with real estate loans held by commercial banks, down they're actually reducing their exposure. At the beginning of the crisis, there were $3.6 trillion dollars of mortgage, residential mortgage loans on bank balance sheets, that's now $3 trillion, down 20 percent over the last three years. Not surprisingly, this is an asset class that has burned the banks and they are trying to reduce their exposure to it. The Basel requirements that are coming online are going to force higher capital charges on these assets and again make this more expensive for banks to hold these assets. So the notion that the banks are going to step in and provide the private capital we seek to crowd in I think is unrealistic. But we all, we've heard in the last two uh, sessions what happened to the private label security market. I totally agree with um, Tony with regard to the fact that it is about trust. The rating agents, agencies prove themselves untrustworthy. The um, underwriters and uh, securitizers prove themselves untrustworthy. This is a market that needs a lot of fix in the plumbing and a lot of fix in the institutions that are providing uh, this. But you can see this thing is dead. Uh, so the notion that the private label securities market is going to step in and private investors without a government guarantee are going to fill the void 
of a wind down of Fannie and Freddie, I think, again, is a very risky assumption. And then, uh, and again, on the third parameter, the other sort of, the other wished for, or hoped for private capital providers that are gonna step in here are the so-called private mortgage insurers. Well, we can see at the peak, the total capital committed to mortgage insurance by the private mortgage insurers was 17 billion, not trillion, 17 billion dollars. Uh, that's now down to, given the erosion in their capital base as a result of the losses they have suffered, you can see that their capital position is now a mere six billion dollars. This is not a crowd who is gonna step back in and provide first loss insurance on four and a half trillion dollars worth of Fannie and Freddie paper. Uh, and you can see that the, the primary insurance in force, they also have withdrawn uh, their footprint in this market from a peak of almost a trillion dollars in 2007, now down to about half a billion as they work through their own portfolio methods. Um, but the truth, so that when you add all of that up, the truth of this marketplace is that although banks originate, they are on the front lines originating with, a, with the, the death of the mortgage broker business, uh, the banks are on the front line. Most of the funding for the residential mortgage market is coming from the securitization market. Uh, and you can see the steady increase uh, in the share uh, of funding provided to mortgages in this country from the securities market. And obviously, as the crisis unfolded, that goes up because the way the government has funneled credit into this market is with a not, as I say, an indirect government guarantee through Fannie and Freddie um, uh, to um, uh, MBS. And so with, the private, with private capital having withdrawn and uh, Fannie and Freddie having been placed in conservatorship and being given a backing of a Treasury Department line of credit or line of equity, uh, the uh, securities market uh, has now dominated, but that is a government guaranteed securities market, not a private label securities market. And as a result of this shift to securitization, you can see that of the residential mortgages outstanding, securities are funding, private investors are funding 63% of the outstanding uh, book. Again, thinking about private capital. Is there enough private capital without a government guarantee to fund $10 trillion of mortgages in this country, which is the outstanding amount? So here is bond market activity, average daily trading volume in the bond markets by big categories of securities, of debt security market. Treasury market, obviously the biggest securities market in the world. The agency MBS market, the next largest uh, securities market in the world. The agency debt market, the third largest securities market in terms of average daily trading volume. And then you get to the corporate debt market, something that you know, we think of as a very big market. It's a fraction the size in terms of its liquidity and daily trading volume to the government-backed market. And then you get to the muni debt market and the non-agency market. So the notion that private investors without a government guarantee are gonna come in here and uh, without a government guarantee and fund $10 trillion worth of mortgage debt, I think is fanciful. Uh, and worse than fanciful, it, to the extent that a reform agenda is based on that assumption, we are taking a huge risk of another downturn uh, in the housing market and the economy. Uh, because if, if, we, if we design a restructuring plan for the housing finance in this country on the assumption that private capital will come back in some Mechan mechanistic way, such as Senator Corker's plan is, 10% reduction every year in the government footprint in this market. Well, what happens if that 10% isn't filled? What happens, what happens to credit formation in the residential mortgage market? And if credit is not available on that mechanistic formula, on that timetable, then we're gonna see a de decline in housing prices for sure. There are 80 million homes in America, 55 million of which have mortgages on them. Most buyers need credit to buy a house. Um, so I, I think m my conclusion on having taken this little intellectual journey on what is this marketplace is that a government guarantee is gonna be necessary both to the liquidity of the market uh, and to the depth of the market. Um, so the question is how do we design a government guarantee to protect taxpayers against the kinds of losses that we have suffered from the implicit guarantee of Fannie and Freddie that have just, uh, just occurred. So 
this is, this is what we think the major criteria should be for any reform plan. You've got to protect the economy against a rapid withdrawal or a disruption of credit availability uh, to housing. You've got to fulfill the promise that we made at the time of the establishment of the conservatorship. Senator, uh, Senator Treasury Secretary Paulson said, we're doing this to make sure that the uh, MBS and agency uh, investors do not suffer any loss, to protect them. So as to provide for the continuous stable credit formation over the last three years that has been provided as a result of the conservatorship. We can't back away from that as a country now. We told these people you're not going to suffer losses. These are the very same people who invest in Treasury securities. We're borrowing an enormous amount of money right now in the Treasury market. If we undermine the full faith and credit effectively that we have uh, put behind Fannie and Freddie, uh, I think we're going to do serious damage to, our, own, to the, our ability to borrow as a nation in the Treasury market as well. So I think we have to somehow figure out how to fulfill the promise we made at the time of the establishment of the conservatorship uh, to make these people whole. Three, because my conclusion is if we want a liquid and deep market, we need a government guarantee on these securities, then that guarantee should be explicit. It should be appropriately priced by an independent agency, um, uh, and it should be against qualified mortgage products, not on entities. We shouldn't be guaranteeing Fannie and Freddie solvency. We should be guaranteeing investor returns uh, on proper qualified products. Um, we should regulate the entities, but we shouldn't be uh, guaranteeing their solvency. Four, we should ensure that there's adequate private capital ahead of the government guarantee. So in, 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 in this world, and, and I think in a funny way, as I was listening to Senator Corker, we actually agree, but we, we have it flipped around. He would take, he would, he would turn Fannie and Freddie into the guarantor and take the guarantee attachment point down 10%, 10%, 10%. So effectively nationalizing Fannie and Freddie and then reducing their attachment point on qualified mortgage product, hoping that private capital, somebody will show up and provide that first loss uh, position. I actually think it should be the other way around, that Fannie and Freddie should be recapitalized, and we should fill them with enormous capital and let them take the first loss and let the government, a new independent agency, be the, the reinsurer. And then we can privatize these guys and, and return them to private ownership. Fifth, and this is the thing that I think will surprise most of you in the audience, given what everybody in this town has said about this. Everyone has said there's no way Fannie and Freddie can replay, repay the $150 billion net that they owe the government. I think that's totally wrong. Um, in fact, uh, you know, the truth uh, about the TARP uh, uh, monies is, is that we've gotten most of that back. Maybe we're all victims of our own experience. My experience was I inherited $180 billion invested in AIG. No, everyone said we'd never get that money back. We did a restructuring of the balance sheet, sold a lot of stuff off, paid the Fed back, converted the preferred to common, and we're well on our way to getting that money back with a significant profit. I think, I think the same thing is true. We can, re and this is what I do for a living, we can re-engineer Fannie and Freddie's balance sheet and income statement so as to put them on a path where they can actually pay the taxpayers back. Not a small consideration in a town looking for money uh, with significant deficits. So how to do this? We need to establish a federal mortgage insurance corporation. Maybe that's FUFA. Uh, repurposed and with a new mission. I don't, I'm not here to, you know, create big government, new agencies all over town. Uh, so maybe it is we do take the expertise that has built up in FUFA as the conservator over these two entities, and we turn them into an FMIC. I view this like the FDIC. We have run a very successful insurance program for the last 80 years in this country called the FDIC. It has never lost a dime of taxpayer money, and it has managed to prevent bank runs by guaranteeing deposits. I think we can do on that same model, independent agency uh, that tries to charge an appropriate price for its guarantee, it gets it wrong, just like the private market uh, insurers get it wrong. The great thing about a government guarantee agency, if it's in business for life, it can adjust its premiums to reflect its prior period losses and make up what it lost in prior periods without hitting the taxpayers of the United States. The FDIC has done this very successfully for the last 80 years. I think we can do the same thing in mortgages uh, with an independent agency. It would be, uh, we have to insulate it. We have to build firewalls to prevent the kind of 
uh, interference that went on through Ofeo in the life of Fannie and Freddie during the 90s and during the Bush administration. Both Democratic administrations and Republican administrations were guilty of this. We need to build firewalls to protect this insurer against uh, expanding the credit box and exposing taxpayers to risk, uh, and, but to perform its function. The FDIC, again, I think is a very good model of how this has been done. Um, the nature of the reinsurance and fees, as I said, it, they should have a, two missions. This agency should be chartered by Congress with two missions, to make sure there is stable credit formation in the residential mortgage market, and two, to protect taxpayers against losses. And the way to, the way to it, it can ensure that there is stable credit formation, as the previous panels talked about, is by varying the attachment point. In periods where private capital has, has withdrawn from the scene, as they have done over the last three years, the attachment point can go up. Uh, and the government will take more of the loss position. In an era when private capital is, is robustly taking risk in the mortgage market, you can lower the attachment point and vary the fee accordingly. Um, the conditions for the reinsurance would be uh, that um, it would be available not just to Fannie and Freddie, but to anybody else who's prepared to form a separately capitalized mortgage insurer uh, who submits to the, regula to the capital adequacy and safety and soundness regulation of this entity. This is exactly what the FDIC does. You want our deposit insurance? You submit to regulation by the FDIC. You meet its capital adequacy standards. You meet its safety and soundness standards. Um, and again, we have these successful precedents uh, for how to do this. So imagine with me tomorrow. We wave a magic wand, Congress finds bipartisan support, uh, and they create an independent agency uh, such as I've just described. The first thing that agency would do is wrap all the outstanding uh, F, uh, Fannie and Freddie MBS, guarantee it, and take a fee for the privilege of doing so. We, uh, there are mechanical issues how to do this, but I think it actually can be done through exchange offers. I think every investor holding those securities would do it in a heartbeat. Um, I actually think those securities would trade tighter and it would create um, a huge uh, opportunity both for refinancing because rates would actually drop as a result of putting the full faith and credit with an explicit guarantee on it. Um, but that's a detail. You don't have to believe that. Just follow me here. We wrap all four and a half trillion of outstanding MBS at Fannie and Freddie and take the 10 basis points that they gave to the payroll tax that Senator Corker was talking about this morning and make, give this as a fee to the agency to start to build a reserve fund to protect itself against losses. Fannie and Freddie then st oh, have already wrapped these securities with their own guarantee, so they are now effectively a first loss insurer. Um, and so now we can talk about the recapitalization of Fannie and Freddie. So, uh, this allows for the smooth transition. So we've now taken care of the first objective, which we've wrapped the MBS, so we've fulfilled our promise to the holders of uh, the outstanding securities that they will be whole. Uh, the second step then is to recapitalize Fannie and Freddie so that they can actually provide real first loss insurance. Although there's been a lot of talk about what a great job Ed DeMarco is doing, actually if you look at the statute, he had two jobs, conserve assets and restore solvency. He's done nothing to restore the solvency. We have a lot of chat about G fees and increasing G fees and he's studying it and it's four years in and we still haven't increased G fees except for the mandated, um, the mandated uh, increase that um, the Congress did with regard to, the, to as a pay for. So uh, the first thing we need to do to restore their solvency is raise their G fees. Everybody concedes in this town that they have underpriced themselves over the years and the fact that they're so, those G fees are so low is, is deterring private credit formation uh, because the rates are so low. They're just not appropriately priced for the risk. So these G fees need to be raised. If you raise the G fees, their revenues will increase. Very simple. Uh, if you turn off the Treasury Department's dividend, they can actually keep that increased uh, revenue and start to recapitalize themselves, actually build capital to provide to, so that they actually have capital standing in front of our new government insurer, protecting that government insurer against loss. Um, if you play this out uh, as, as we have done, so we've done some modeling around this, this is what, what you know, investment bankers do for a living. Um, so you immediately raise the G fees. Uh, you refocus these two entities on the core guarantee business. So what we would do is sort of a good bank, bad bank 
um, uh, restructuring. Take the portfolio, take the debt, take the Treasury Department's preferred stock uh, net worth guarantee, put that over on the bank, bad bank, let the portfolios wind down over time uh, and pay off the agency debt to the extent there's a deficiency, the Treasury Department preferred stock is there uh, to ensure that the agency debt is paid fully. On the guarantee side, we now have a wrap from uh, the, a new the new agency. The new agency is getting 10 basis points of the increased GC. The balance of the increased GC is coming into Fannie and Freddie and staying there to help build capital uh, so as to protect the new agency against loss in the event that the book proves uh, to have losses in it. Uh, so we, for the ritual slaughter crowd, you know, end the GSEs, we, we agree and the GSC hedge fund. The, the government-sponsored hedge fund should be wound down over time. The core guarantee business, which is critical to credit formation in this country, should be recapitalized and privatized. Uh, so you get to, um, one, one of the things Ed is doing that I think is exactly right, and it's on the Gini model, is to create a common security. So to create a common securitization utility, and so as to create a common security that both Fannie and Freddie can uh, securitize into, and Chase Manhattan, or they don't call him Chase Manhattan anymore, J.P. Morgan, I'm showing my age, J.P. Morgan, uh, uh, Wells Fargo, and any other uh, party, private party, that wants to separately capitalize a subsidiary to provide first loss insurance uh, subject to the regulation of the new entity can play. Um, Based on if, so let me just, I'll, I'll walk through this. If you, uh, this is really, <laughs> this is the payoff here. So this is, this is the modeling that we've done. Um, a, a slow wind down of the portfolio. Um, I think the best way to look at this is on the far column, assuming the two entities are one. Um, so the size of the guarantee book, we think in three or four years from now is, is actually, the footprint is reduced because the GCs have been ra uh, raised and other people are providing uh, th uh, the book. So the book comes down to 4.1 trillion uh, with a uh, with a net sort of 60 basis points um, uh, GC, net after paying over the um, 10 basis points over to the new agency for to help it build this reserve fund. Uh, you've got guarantee income of a total of 24 billion dollars on that book. Um, the, they retain a small portfolio for their liquidity functions. Uh, the multifamily income of two billion, uh, and then normalized provision rates of point uh, five of five percent. You've got, uh, and you n end up with net income of eighteen billion dollars. Uh, we think this thing trades at a ten multiple. At a ten multiple, the government has to convert its treasury preferred into eighty-five percent of the common stock. We converted the Treasury preferred in AIG into 92%. We thought that was the right number given this kind of similar modeling to get the government all of its money back. The government converts uh, its existing outstanding preferred stock into 85% of the total common, sells that off over time, gets back $150 billion, which is ex more than we're currently owed. Uh, so in fact, uh, we can repay uh, the taxpayers. Uh, this will take, we think, I don't know if that chart's here. It's not, okay. Um, we think this, this if, the, if we've been at this for four years, these things have been in conservatorship for four years. Uh, as Senator Corker said, nothing's gonna happen in this town on this topic this year, but it should happen next year. Uh, and you do need legislation to do this because um, we need to form a new uh, agency that can convey the full faith and credit in the same way the FDIC conveys the full faith and credit. But having done that, we think the GFEs can be raised right now, uh, scaling up uh, to get to that 70 basis points we talk about uh, as the new legislation comes into effect. But there's no reason for DeMarco to delay this now. He has the all full power and authority, and in fact, the obligation under the statute under HERA to do it. Um, and so to begin that, Treasury could turn off the preferred right now as part of a plan to recapitalize the agencies and privatize them. The wind down of the book, the book could be separated. All of that can be done without legislation. The only thing we need legislation for is the creation of this new, uh, this new guarantor. Um, 
if this all started right now, the increase in the G fees, the turn off of the Treasury preferred so as to allow them to build capital, uh, this could be done by 2016. The privatization could occur, could occur in 2016. There we think there would be entities with 100 to $120 billion worth of capital ahead of the government on its uh, mortgage insurance. That would be about a 7% tier one capital ratio, standing as a first loss provider ahead of the government of the United States on its reinsurance. This strikes me as fulfilling all five criteria. We have a very smooth transition, just to go back. Um, it protects the economy because state we have stable credit formation. We're not assuming the can opener, as they say in the joke about economists with a can of beans and no can opener, the economist says, assume the can opener. Uh, you know, we're all talking about return private uh, capital to this market, and we're assuming they're going to come. Well, we don't have to assume they're going to come in this market. We're going to actually create two new, huge, well-capitalized private mortgage insurers. And we can do it. We, uh, we control these entities. There's no reason we shouldn't do this. Uh, and make sure that we don't assume the can opener. Let's create the can opener, and that is a first loss provider adequately capitalized and standing in front of the government uh, on its reinsurance. That will protect the economy against uh, a withdrawal of government support for, uh, for mortgage credit that could drive down uh, housing prices. Uh, it'll fulfill the government's promise to the holders of Fannie and Freddie MBS so as to avoid uh, tripping ourselves up in the, in the Treasury market as we continue to borrow billion trillions of dollars a year. It provides an explicit, appropriately priced government backstop from an independent agency uh, for qualified mortgage product. It ensures that there's adequate private capital in this market ahead of the government on its guarantee because we're forcibly recapitalizing Fannie and Freddie, and it gets the taxpayers' money back. I think it, you know, this can be done. Uh, it's not that hard. So with that, I'll shut up and take some questions because I'm sure there's a lot of skepticism. <laughs> Nick. Uh, if, if you believe tax increases, uh, you know, are, are wrong, you can't compromise on, on a, if the GC is wrong, you can't compromise on, on a guarantee. So um, how do you move this through this town and this climate on this issue? So um, I think, look, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a restructuring guy. I'm, I've been hanging, I been now live in D.C. I've been here for three years, so I'm getting familiar with the policy environment, and certainly every citizen in the country is familiar with the political environment. Uh, I think the promise of getting the money back and of actually avoiding uh, a radical disjuncture in credit uh, availability are two big selling points for this plan. I think uh, creating a, the, 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 the gaming of the implied guarantee that went on, this fixes that. So it addresses many of the criticisms that have been made of the current system, uh, and it achieves some political goals that I think are important on both sides of the aisle. I think the affordable housing mission and the goals that we heard about uh, in the previous two panels uh, are, are things that can be addressed uh, without necessarily having to burden the restructuring and, uh, and privatization plan here with them. Uh, and we have some, I have some ideas, but again, there, there are people in this audience and in this town uh, with deeper backgrounds in affordable housing than I who have very good ideas. We've talked to them and have very good ideas. Uh, and, you know, I think, that, I think that those will inevitably become part of the policymaking process and the legislating process uh, to reconcile the two. But with regard to Fannie and Freddie, just looking at, you know, sort of it's a little bit of the New Testament, the first shall be last. These were the first two entities that were uh, taken over effectively by the government who got a government um, a guaranteed equity in September. And here we are four years later. The J.P. Morgan's, Goldman Sachs's, Bank of America's, Citibank's have come and gone out of the TARP program. Even AIG. Uh, what was considered the, you know, the biggest of the basket cases in the, of the large financial institutions uh, in the crisis has come and almost gone. And yet these two things, who were so critical to housing finance, are still sitting uh, under government conservatorship. I think, I think this is a pathway to uh, at least unwinding this uh, chapter of our unfortunate economic history. Sorry, in the back.
Chris Russell with Congressman Scott Garrett's office. Um, a couple of things. One, um, the same people that argue that this can be done today and be done in a manner that protects the taxpayers will be the same people that will be lobbying five years from now to lower the standards or change the guarantee or do whatever to put the burden back on taxpayers. So that's one concern. And two, I think I point to two specific things that have just happened in the last six months that show exactly why a great idea like yours and a great idea like many other people who always come, have come from a deep Wall Street background and understand the markets and always can say, well, this can work if you just structure it just like this and it'll all work perfect. Two specific examples. One, the uh, decision by Congress after the FHA and GSE loan limits went down, the market had made preparations for that. Everything was going fine. The housing industrial complex came back in, lobbied Congress very hard, using our political muscle to get FHA loan limits back up. Now, anyone I talk to on the street says FHA limits being higher than GSEs is absolutely crazy, but yet that's the environment in which we live in when we have politicians making these decisions. Mm -hmm. So that's one. And if you don't, and, and, and to your point that private capital, how are we going to know if private capital is ever going to be back? How we know if is it going to be there? Well, we are definitely know it won't be there if the government's always going to come back in and outprice that private capital. So <laughs> the only way you can really see that is to get the government out of the way. So then, two, the other point is the G fee. What happened with the G fees and moving those G fees to a different fund? That proves the point in and of itself right there that you can never have any type of government like insurance for the housing market and not have the G fees pay for Social Security, Medicare, whatever. I mean, you can imagine a situation in 20 years when Congress needs extra money when Medicare is broke. Hey, let's get this affordable, let's get this uh, credit loss over here, you know, $20 billion set up. I'd rather pay them, Grammy and Grandma's health insurance, than set aside money for a future credit event. So to that point, I just don't know why we're talking about subsidizations. I don't know why the subsidization always has to be done through the financing of homes as opposed to, I think I saw Mr. Rosner earlier advocates for, if you're going to subsidize housing, do it through the tax code or do it through direct appropriations. Why we are we doing do it through the tax code Yeah, why <laughs> we do already. The, uh, the amorphous fi financing through the guarantees and who that benefits. Is it going to benefit the investor? Does it benefit Wall Street and the big banks who the president likes to criticize? Or does it benefit the homeowners? And I think there's a mixed discussion on where that benefit actually goes. Yeah, I mean, look, obviously, if um, it's, it's very hard to argue, particularly with a congressman's staff, the Congress is ready to jump in and, and do some weird stuff. Uh, but this is a mess that the government created over two uh, administrations, and this is, a way to, this is a way to clean up that mess. And I do think that the FDIC stands as a counterfactual to the proposition you've made that uh, a government agency that's providing an explicit guarantee, appropriately priced, uh, independent, of the Congress with a very defined mission by statute uh, can resist uh, uh, lobbying. It hasn't done it perfectly over time, but it has never cost the taxpayers a dime, and it has prevented bank runs. And so the risk that I think, with all due respect, you run uh, in, in an effort to back the government out for fear that it is, um, for fear that it is somehow mispricing credit uh, is that you're going to reduce credit formation. I, I am, for one, as an American, given the size of this market and, the imp and as a homeowner and the importance of stable credit formation to this market, if the Congress of the United States really makes the decision to assume the can opener, that if we just back the government out, they'll come, I think what you're going to get, and you heard it, there will be a 30-year fixed rate mortgage. It'll be just more expensive and therefore less available. There will be less credit and there will be a decline in house prices. And my guess is, Senator, that, that, uh, that your congressman will not be reelected because your, his, the people in his district will revolt against a self-inflicted wound. Um, one of the things that I was trying to, one of the things I was trying to show you in the, in, the, in the size of the market and who's providing credit in this market, it's not coming from banks. Uh, it's coming from securities investors, and it's not coming from the private label securities investors. It's coming from government investors, investors in governments. And so, yes, we can reduce the footprint over time. My vision on this, to get to where you want to be, is that, that the attachment point on the reinsurance, just as Senator Corker suggests, can drop over time. But rather than assume that private capital is going to come in and provide all the capital necessary to back this market in the size this market currently is, is to recapitalize Fannie and Freddie, let them play that first loss provider and make them private companies again. They are then the private capital standing in front of the government and the agency 
can drop that attachment point down from 95% today to 90 to 85, depending on credit conditions. But I think the FDIC actually is something that you guys need to look at and decide whether or not you think that is sufficiently insulated and has a sufficient firewalls against political interference to be able to adequately protect the taxpayers against loss on a government guarantee. Because I think over the last 80 years, they've done a very good job of it. Sir in the back. Uh, I'm just trying to follow through what the net worth of the entities would be after this uh, recapitalization. Because the current um, preferred stock agreement was filling in a, in a gap. That's so right. So if they take in $180 billion and then pay that out to the U.S. government, aren't they still at a zero net worth? No. This is the magic of uh, the capitalization of earnings. So um, if the Treasury – this is exactly what we did with the AAG. If the Treasury Department converts its preferred stock into common stock and then sells it into the, into the private markets on the New York Stock Exchange – so we're privatizing Fannie and Freddie by retaking them public, terminating the conservatorships. It, we're not taking the cash out of Fannie and Freddie, but investors are paying the government for the privilege of owning that stock. This is exactly what happened with AIG. It has zero net worth today, but if I raise the G fees and I turn off the dividend, they build capital. And they actually, as that, as that statement shows, right, these, this is a, these are entities – that are producing in the aggregate uh, four years from now $18 billion worth of net income. The, g the public markets, the public stock markets will pay for that, we think, on a 10 multiple. And therefore, when the Treasury Department converts its stock to equity, it can sell that off over time uh, and get its money back. No, it won't have a zero on that. Well, you're not listening to me. It will – here, listen, listen. This, is, this, is, this math isn't that hard. This is – they build up $24 billion – they have $24 billion of pre-tax revenue. It'll be $120 billion. $120 billion. That's what it'll be. Sir. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I actually think that in the the environment has changed. Um, uh, in the in the heat of the banker bailout of two thousand nine and ten, where you know the government was viewed as having done something for the financial sector that it and uh, that was sort of unnatural. Uh, the notion that we were going to restructure Fannie and Freddie, who many in this town think are the key cause of the crisis. Um, I think that was politically untenable, and there was no rush. I mean, the mortgage market was, uh, was in a, a state of disrepair. Um, as we heard earlier in the first panel, you know, the mortgage market now and the housing market is stable. It may yet have a leg down, uh, but it's stable. Uh, and so the notion of doing something constructive with these entities and, and effectively transforming them, which is what I'm talking about. I mean, I, what I'm suggesting is the government-sponsored hedge funds should be shut down. Uh, that arbitrage on the government guarantee uh, should, should, shouldn't have happened and should not go forward. But we should take advantage of the fact of having these two large entities in conservatorship to use them for the public purpose of, of having an orderly transition to private uh, – a, a, a more private capital fed mortgage market. Uh, I, the alternative of assuming the can opener and hoping the private markets will come I think is very dangerous. Okay.